If I ever get around to writing a book, I think I'm going to set the margins really wide so that people will have plenty of room to write their reflections on what they're reading. Because it occurs to me that as things happen to us along the way, how we reflect upon those stories, what we write in the margins, if you will, is really what becomes our stories. Now, as I look at things that have happened to me in the past, uh, to be honest, I would like to put myself as the central character in most of the stories. The truth of the matter is, I really have spent most of my time on the edge of things. And whatever resulted in those stories, the change was mostly in me. Well, here are some of those stories from the edge, if you will. rock a bye baby in the treetop. When the wind blows, the cradle will rock. When the bow breaks, the cradle will fall. And down will come baby, cradle and all. I'm not sure that I was ever rocked in a cradle, but I'm relatively sure that my mother would ne never have placed my cradle in a treetop. But I did live about half an hour's drive from another kind of cradle, Montgomery, Alabama, the cradle of the Confederacy. I was 23 years old at the time that this story took place. I'd come back from the Korean War, had married, had one son, and had enrolled in Vanderbilt Divinity School on my way to becoming a Methodist preacher. He was 26. He had married uh, within two weeks of the time that I had married and had uh, a daughter had graduated from Boston with a Ph.D., and had been called to be the pastor of the Dexter Avenue Baptist Church in Montgomery. That was a black congregation, and he, of course, in those days, would have been a black preacher. It was summertime, 1955, and it was time for the cradle to be rocked. A 42 year old black woman who worked as a domestic and a seamstress, college educated, got on a city bus in Montgomery one afternoon and did what anybody would do. She sat down in the first available seat. But it wasn't in the back of the bus, and she was black. The bus driver told her to move, and she said no. And people have said that when Rosa Parks sat down on a city bus in Montgomery, Alabama that day, the rest of the world stood up, and the cradle started shaking. Some of the black people said, mm-mm, if we can't sit where we want to on the bus, We'll just have to figure out another way to get where we need to go. Enough is enough. We're tired of supporting a two-bit system that treats us less than human with our hard-earned nickels and dimes. And some of their neighbors who had cars said, well, tell you what, we'll take you where you need to go. And so a kind of voluntary taxi service developed. The Montgomery bus boycott was a movement that was waiting to happen, had been waiting to happen for a long time. The young black Baptist preacher found himself in the middle of a movement that needed leadership, and he rose to the occasion. When I think about those days, I don't think that either white or black folks thought at the time that their world was going to be seriously changed, but it was. While the black people who had been mostly disenfranchised were getting hold of new leadership, 
some of the more radical white people who had um, worn the hood and the robes of the Ku Klux Klan were shedding the road the robes and were becoming members of a newly organized white citizens council and you might say that intimidation for the most part had moved out from under the sheets and the hoods and into the courts some of the white people who wanted to hold on to the status quo at all cost they said things are going to change over my dead body but more and more black people were beginning to say things have to change right now. And this young black Baptist preacher found himself in the middle of that turmoil. And what he said was, we're going to win this battle, but we're not going to fight. One night, as the bow was beginning to break, I sat in my parents' kitchen and heard them talk about this young black outside agitator, as they call him, who was going too far, too fast, and was going to be the cause of a lot of people getting hurt. My parents, like a lot of their neighbors, like most of their neighbors, wanted things to stay the way they were. But those days were gone. Not everybody knew it. And I think they were, I know they were getting scared. My mother and daddy were good people. They were honest and hardworking and compassionate. And they treated people kindly, whether they were white or black, no matter who they were. And they respected people who were honest and hardworking and caring. But they were also children of the South. And in those days, Integration was a dirty word, and they felt that things had to stay the way they were. My daddy got angry, and he said, it's never going to happen. When I caught mother in one of her less heated moments, she said, we're just not ready for it. And I kept pushing and saying, mother, when will we be ready? Well, after supper, I went back to my room and thought about what I'd heard, and I made a few notes, raised a few questions. I had a lot of thinking to do. I had a few days before I had to be back in Nashville. And the next morning when I read the morning paper, the Montgomery Advertiser, I saw that there was going to be a White Citizens Council rally in Crampton Bowl that night. So I went. It looked and sounded like an evangelistic rally. They, someone, a preacher, in fact, opened the meeting with prayer, and everybody stood and sang. Now, they didn't sing a hymn. They sang Dixie. Uh, the platform had been erected, and the speakers all wore suits. There were no crosses burned, and no one was hung in effigy, and nobody wore hoods. But there was no talk of love. It was all fear and anger. Even though a lot of the people there were church-going people, and I know that because I recognized some of them. The single agenda for that meeting was the preservation of a segregated way of life at all cost. Well, I listened, I watched, and I took a few more notes. So far, I realized I'd only heard from white people. So the next morning, I found my way to the MIA office on Hull Street in Montgomery. The Montgomery Improvement Association was the driving force of the bus boycott, and it was housed in a modest two-story brick building. I was back in Montgomery some time ago, and I drove down Hull Street Curious to see if things were still the same. Well, the neighborhood has run down a little bit, but that little brick building is still there. It's used for a couple of different things now, and I noticed that there were uh, bars over the windows and the doors. But there weren't any bars over the doors the morning that I walked in in 1955. 
I just opened the door, stepped in the office, and I asked if I could talk to Dr. King. And I still remember how everything got really quiet. I had heard people talking before I went in, but when I asked for Dr. King, everything got really quiet. And a young black man uh, came out, introduced himself as one of Dr. King's aides, and, uh, and was also a black preacher, a uh, Baptist preacher. And he said, Dr. King is in conference right now, but uh, if there's anything I can do, I'd be glad to talk to you. So we found a, an empty office, and I pulled out the notes I'd been taking. Now, I've lost those notes over the years, and I think probably just as well, because I had really written down everything that I'd heard, and some of it, would, I'm sure, would have been offensive. But I was trying to find something that would give me some hope and would help me understand what was going on. I don't think I had any, I know I didn't have any idea how hard the cradle would be rocked before there would be any hope at all. Well, we'd been talking for a while and the door opened and the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. came in. We shook hands and I was introduced and as we sat, he listened carefully to the questions and started answering them. We'd been talking for five, maybe seven minutes, and the door popped open, and an older, very agitated black man came in the room. And I never will forget, he said, I'm going to get a gun, and I'm going to shoot the next cop that hassled me. Well, you remember I said that some of the black people who owned cars had offered to take their neighbors to wherever they wanted to go? Well, that was the voluntary taxi service that had been developed. And the police were stopping all of those people and in some cases harassing them, in some cases uh, even making up some charges to put a, trying to put them out of business. And this man was obviously one of those voluntary taxi drivers. It was also obvious that he'd had enough. Well, when he burst into the room and said what he did, Dr. King very calmly uh, stood up and said to me, Mr. Hale, I'm sorry, but I need to spend some time with the brother. Put his arm around the man and walked with him into another office. I stayed for a few minutes talking to the, the other man, and then I left. In late September, I got word that Dr. King was going to speak at Fisk University. Fisk is a prestigious black university in Nashville, Tennessee. And by this time, I was back in, I was in seminary. Also, by this time, the bus boycott had gained uh, momentum and had given birth to the movement. And Martin Luther King, Jr. was traveling and speaking all over the country. Vanderbilt was <clears throat> just a short way from Fisk, and so I took my portable tape recorder over to record what Dr. King had to say. Now, you need to know that in 1955, my portable tape recorder was a 43-pound reel-to-reel machine. I got there early, I set up the recorder, taped the microphone to the lectern, and I sat down in the middle of the front row and began to read and wait for the crowd. After a while, I was aware that somebody had taken a seat at the end of the row where I was sitting. And I looked up, and when I looked up, I said, Dr. King. And he said, Mr. Hale. Well, as my R British Royal Navy chaplain friend says, me flabber was gasted. And I said, how in the world did you remember my name? Dr. King said, how many white folks do you think ever came into the MIA headquarters? I saw Dr. King in person once after that at a rally in Chicago, but I never spoke to him again. But I have to say that simply meeting that man and shaking hands with him was a pivotal experience in my life. Well, you probably know the history of the boycott. 
the black people did hold together. And the power came not just from the young people, it came from the old people. I remember one 72-year-old woman said when somebody asked if she was tired of walking, she said with that um, ungrammatical profundity, my feet is tired, but my soul is rested. The boycott ended a little over a year after it started when the Supreme Court um, outlawed all segregated public transportation in the city. But by this time, it had become a prologue to the civil rights movement. For a long time, I didn't tell this story because I didn't know how people would take it. I, I didn't know if they would think that I was tending to be some kind of hero or very important person. Or if, on the other hand, they simply wouldn't understand what an impact that meeting had on me. Well, it's obvious that it, my shaking hands with Dr. King didn't have much of an impact on the civil rights movement. But what I hope is clear is that it was an emotional and transforming personal experience for me. And that's one of those that I have written in the margins as I remember those days. I told this story some time back to some sixth grade students in Washington, D.C. And one of the black students came up afterwards and asked if he could shake my hand. And after we had shaken hands, he left the room chanting, I shook the hand of the man who shook the hand of the man. And it hit me that my story does need to be told, if for no other reason than as a reminder of the power of a simple handshake. By the time I graduated from Vanderbilt in 1958, I was already serving a circuit of six Methodist churches that were situated roughly between Montgomery and Selma, Alabama. I had a crazy preaching schedule, but I was young and, and uh, eager, and I stayed busy almost all the time. I had a lot of fun, and I learned a lot of things, and there were some difficult times. One of those was my first funeral. It took place at the Mount Zion Methodist Church, and I have to tell you, it was a doozy. A lumberman in the community had died, and it looked like everybody in the community showed up at the funeral. Hazel was one of the members of the church, and I think she was concerned. I'm not so sure as much because I was so young as it was because I didn't know the customs of the community. And I had visited with the widow uh, when I heard about the, the death and also with the undertaker, and we had made arrangements for the funeral. And so I thought that was pretty well in place. It was summertime, it was hot as blue blazes, and of course in those days the church had no air conditioning. And flowers, man, the flowers were all over the front of the church, so much so that I could hardly see the congregation. And none of that helped my hay fever. But hay fever was going to be the least of my problems that afternoon. The uh, widow had requested that the casket stay open and that after the service, she and the family and the whole congregation be allowed to come by and view the, the body. And the undertaker was to stay back in the entrance of the church to direct traffic, and he was to have his 18-year-old assistant stand by the casket as people came by. Well, I didn't see any problem with that arrangement. We had it worked out ahead of time. At least I didn't see a problem until Hazel caught me out in the churchyard just before the service was to begin. She said, Max, I, don't, I know you don't know Mrs. Howard, the, uh, the widow, but she's going to try to get in the casket. And I said, Hazel, what are you talking about? She said, Max, nobody else is going to say this, but she really didn't give a whit about her husband. And truth of the matter is, she had good reason, because I think he's chased about everybody in this community that has a skirt. 
and caught many of them. And she's not all that sorry to see him go, but she's going to have to put up a, a front. She's going to try to get in the casket with him. Why, well, I found that hard to believe. But I took Hazel seriously, and so as I conducted the service as we had planned, except that when I came to the benediction, I moved down from the chancel area so that I could stand by the casket, and I uh, moved the uh, assistant over a little bit. And then I invited anybody who wanted to to come by and pay their last respects. Well, when I said that, there was a lady that was dressed in all black uh, down near the front on my right, and she started to moan. And then another lady sitting uh, back over on my the other side and then near the back, she started to moan. And then other people started joining in. Well, I realized pretty quickly that what we had was what I would call professional mourners. So we had a lot of people moaning and crying and carrying on. And when they started that, the widow started her little parade. She came up to the casket, and when she got to the casket, she moaned and cried, Oh, Lord, I can't live without you. What am I going to do? And then she plopped over her upper body and her arms over on top of the body and just kept on moaning. Well, I didn't see any tears, and I remembered what Hazel had told me, so I put my arms around her, around her shoulders, and I said, Now, now, everything's going to be all right. She just kept on moaning. And then I tried to pull her up, and she wouldn't budge. She was a big woman. So finally, I, I, I reached out as hard as I could to find pressure points under her arms, and I squeezed with all the strength I had. And I put my mouth right up against her ear, and I said, Get up, or I'll break your back. And I kept trying to pull her up. After a while, I could feel her give. And she straightened up, walked out of the church, and got into the car to get ready to go to the cemetery. And after everybody else had walked by, the undertaker came up, closed the casket, and we were ready to go. Well, I was just about to get in the hearse with the undertaker to lead the procession for the burial when Hazel caught up with me. <laughs> she said, Max, you did a good job with that. You came out okay, but I got to tell you, she's going to try to get in the grave. Well, by this time, I knew that Hazel knew what she was talking about. But all of a sudden it hit me that maybe if she could tell me what the widow was going to do, she might be also able to tell the widow what I was going to do. And so I said, Hazel, after what went on in there a few minutes ago, if she wants to get, to get in the grave, I'm not going to stand in her way. We got to the graveside and I conducted a brief committal service. And the widow and her two daughters were sitting right by the grave in folding chairs. I told the pallbearers that when I gave the benedic benediction, they were to move back away from the grave. And so I said the words, and they moved back. Nobody standing close by. Mrs. Howard started moaning and carrying on, and sure enough, she stood up. And I thought for a minute that she was actually going to fall into the grave. But I also noticed that she'd moan a little bit and then she'd look out of the corner of her eye to see if anybody was going to stop her. And when she looked at me, I just stepped back. And she tottered there for a few seconds and then collapsed back in the chair. And I moved over to offer my condolences. The, the undertaker escorted her and the family away from the grave. And the very first funeral I had conducted came to an end. That experience not only gave me a whole new understanding of what it meant to stand on the edge of things, but also taught me a valuable lesson in communication. And it's one that I used quite a bit during the three years I served as pastor at Mount Zion. And by the way, Hazel and I became very good friends. <laughs>
I've always been pretty good about following directions and, and finding my way around in new territory. But I also know that I'm in trouble anytime somebody gives me directions and says, you can't miss it. That's when I miss it. Right after I had moved to the church in Autogaville, I needed to talk to the chairman of the official board, Bill Jones. So one morning I went by the store and I asked Mary if she could tell me where Bill lived. And she said, oh yeah, sure. She said, you just go out on the road towards Selma for about two miles and turn right at the Red Cross store and just follow the road till it, it, till it ends. Well, that was simple enough. But I had driven two miles and I didn't see any store. In fact, I didn't see any building of any kind. So I kept on driving, still nothing. And I'd driven for another four miles and I came to another store. So I went in and I asked if anybody could tell me where Bill Jones lived. And one of the men who was sitting over on a nail keg playing checkers with another man said, uh, sure, he said, you just go back down the road toward Autogaville for four miles and turn left at the Red Cross store. Well, I figured that would have put me just about the place that Mary had said. So I thought I'd just missed something, so I drove back down the road. Still didn't see any sign of a store. So I wound up back at Mary's store, and I went in, and I said, Mary, I drove out like you told me, but I, I didn't see any sign of a Red Cross store. And she said, oh, there's nothing there anymore. Then she yelled at her husband. She said, Earl, how long has it been since the Red Cross store burned? He said, well, let me see. I think that burned down back in 34. Well, it turned out that the Red Cross store was never a store at all. It was a cotton shed that had been used for a few years during the Depression to hand out relief supplies. And it had burned down 23 years before. I drove out for about two miles, spotted a little dirt road, and made my way to Bill Jones' house. Now, the interesting thing about that story for me is that after I had lived there for three years, if you had asked me how to get to Bill Jones' house, I would have told you to go out for about two miles and turn right at the Red Cross store. And everybody in a toggle would understand. Frank Gober ran a store out near the Ivy Creek Church, and Frank didn't have much use for the church. Not too long after I moved into the area, I stopped in one day to get a few things that we needed and, and also to introduce myself. Frank was puffing away on that little cigar he kept in his mouth all the time. He said, you the new preacher? I said, yeah, that's right. I said, my name's Max Hale. He said, I'm Frank Gober, and I don't go to church. I said, I understand. I need a loaf of bread. Well, he chomped down on that cigar and walked over to the counter and got a loaf of bread and handed it to me. And he said, you want to know why I don't go to church? Well, I said, not particularly. I need a gallon of milk, too. Well, he went to the cooler and got out the milk, and he put that on the counter, and he said, I'll tell you why I don't go to church. There's too many damn hypocrites in it. I said, well, I understand. How much did I owe you? And I paid him, and as, as I started out the door, I turned around, and I said, oh, by the way, Frank, don't let the fact that we've got a lot of hypocrites in the church stop you. We've got, always got room for one more. Now, it would probably make a better story if I could say that after a while... Frank gave in and came to church. But he didn't, at least not as long as I was there. And he never stopped needling me. One day when I stopped in from making hospital calls, Frank said, Preacher, you like chicken? I said, well, sure. He said, would you take one if I gave it to you? And I said, well, of course. He said, well, I'll tell you what. You just go out there in the chicken yard and I'll give you whatever you catch. So I took off my coat, I loosened my tie, and I got out in the chicken yard. 
and I picked out the biggest, plumpest-looking hen, and I caught it, brought it back in the store. And Frank, who I'm sure didn't think that I'd actually chase down a chicken, said, Damn, that's one of my best hens. I said, Sorry, Frank. You said I could have the one I caught. This is the one I want. Appreciate it. One of the men sitting over by the stove playing checkers just hollered. Guess he got you there, Frank. And Frank just chomped down his cigar and walked to the back of the store. Frank never came to church, and it would be stretching things to say that we ever became friends. But we did understand each other. About the time I was graduating from seminary, a retired minister friend said, Max, I'm not one to give a lot of advice, but I think you need to remember it's the little things that'll get you. I didn't know what he was talking about at the time, but it didn't take me long to find out. It was 1958, and the issue that was on everybody's mind in Alabama was racial integration. It just flat out overpowered everything else. In the Methodist Church, the issue was if and how to integrate the church. Not, necess not necessarily at the local level, but at the national level. Within two weeks after I became the pastor, the Autogable Methodist Church took a vote on whether or not to support a plan that would integrate the church at the national level. And the vote not to support carried by a vote of 19 to 1. I was the one. I remember most of that discussion. It was hot and heavy. Tempers flared. And I really wondered if I would be able to survive as pastor. But I did. And I served that church for three years before I moved on to become a campus pastor. But in the meantime... The issue that really did almost do me in was the church bulletin. The whole thing started at a meeting of the official board, and somebody complained that people were leaving their worship bulletins in the sanctuary after worship, and it made a mess. We didn't have a janitor, and so it was a problem for people to, for somebody to pick them up. Well, I didn't think it was much of a problem. Uh, but apparently everybody else did, and the discussion went on for, I don't know, several minutes. And I decided not to get in on it. But I also started working out in my mind how to take care of the situation, and I decided I'd just do it quietly. It was really easy. As the pastor, I not, and we didn't have a church secretary, I not only put the bulletin together, but because we didn't have a secretary, I did the printing and the folding and made the copies available to the ushers. We had a hymn board, what we called a hymn board, in the sanctuary where we put the numbers of the hymns that we were going to sing and the responsive reading for that Sunday so that people could follow in their uh, hymnals. And then to make things even easier, the order of worship that we used was printed in the front of the hymnal. So, after all the ruckus in the board meeting, I put together the next Sunday's bulletin. And instead of the order of service on the front page, I put the sermon topic, I put an outline of the sermon, uh, the scripture, and then below that, since I had plenty of room, I printed the names of the hymns that we were going to be singing, and I even put a little historical note about one of them. And on the second page and on the back, I put all the announcements just like we had always been doing. And Sunday morning came. I took the bulletins over to the ushers, but instead of letting them give the bulletins out to people as they came in, I told them to hold them and hand them out as people left. Well, the service went okay. Nobody questioned anything. We had the hymn board and this order of service I referred to. Uh... And it went, I think it went very smooth. Uh, the bulletin actually provided more information 
uh, than it had before. But what was more important because of the discussion the previous week was that nobody left a bulletin cluttering up the sanctuary. They took it home. They had it to refer to if, if they wanted to about meetings that were coming up. And to be quite frank about it, I complimented myself on being such a genius. Well, that self-congratulation kept up until I went down to get my mail the next morning. Roberta, the postmistress, was the one that gave me my first hint that uh, ever, not everybody appreciated my clever solution. And by the time the board met the following Thursday, I was aware that a storm was brewing. The chairman called the meeting to order. I offered a brief prayer. And before the chairman could ask if there was any old business, Beulah Lee, who was hyperventilating so that she could hardly talk, said, I, I want to know why we can't have the bulletin the way we've always had it. Well, I wasn't going to get caught in this. And being my usual clever self and, and not wanting this to get be blown up any more than it already had, I said, I don't see a problem. I can do it the way we've always done it. Well, if I thought that that was going to put things to rest, I was mistaken. Forty-five minutes after I had agreed to return to doing the bulletin in the usual way, the discussion was still going on. Now, obviously, I went back to doing the bulletin the old way. But when the meeting adjourned that night about 10.30, I was out in the backyard and started lifting weights and trying to decide whether or not I was going to stay in the ministry. Although there was never a complete meeting of the minds on integration, I never felt that my role as a pastor was at risk because of that. But the church bulletin? Well, as I well remembered my retired friend saying, it's the little things that'll get you. And that one almost did. When it comes to this next story, uh, I really need wide margins to write about what I saw and how I felt. In fact, as I think about it, I still am writing things down. The date was January the 6th, 1964. Uh, it was a cool, cloudy day, and there was what my grandfather would have called a dry drizzle that was coming down. If it had been another year, um, I would have spent my time sprucing up the campus ministry center and getting programs lined up for the next semester and taking some long breaks in the pool room that was right across the street because it was between semesters. It was also registration for the second semester, and this year that was going to be historic in the life of Auburn University. The central character in that day's drama was a 31-year-old graduate student who would be the first black student in Auburn University's history. I was a campus pastor, and while, for the most part, my role in the drama that unfolded was marginal, I was, I was deeply affected by what happened. And here's what happened. Those, uh, you may remember, were turbulent times. When the University of Mississippi had been integrated, there were riots and buildings had been burned and people had been hurt. George Wallace, uh, who was the governor, had stood in the doorway of the University of Alabama to prevent integration. And a lot of us at Auburn were afraid of what was going to happen when Auburn integrated. Uh, several of us, campus ministers, local pastors, and a couple of professors worked behind the scenes trying to do what we could to set up a peaceful atmosphere. And five of us, uh, campus pastors, got into a car, drove over to Ole Miss, and we met with a whole variety of people there about to try to find out what they had learned from the mistakes that they had made. And our future at Auburn was uncertain, to say the least. Everybody was tense. 
We also knew it was going to happen. The university was going to be integrated sooner or later, peacefully or not. And there were a lot of behind-the-scenes deals being struck. Uh, Governor Wallace would save face by not coming on the campus. But he had also ordered Colonel Al Lingo and the, his state highway patrolman to use force, if necessary, to keep federal agents off the campus. And what we all knew but was not made public was that the troopers also were under orders to try to prevent the new student from ever getting on campus. It was, it was very dramatic. But for all outward purposes, Auburn University was going to manage its own affairs, and the federal agents, FBI and Justice Department uh, among them, were in town, but they stayed off the campus. And in fact, they stayed at the Holiday Inn. Well, as the old saying goes, timing is everything. And the powers that be had decided that the first black student in Auburn's history would register for the second semester. So on January the 6th, 1964, Harold Alonzo Franklin, married, insurance salesman, graduate from Alabama State College with honors, a native son of Talladega, a town that was about 100 miles away, made history. As I said, timing is everything. And between semesters, there were just not a lot of students around. Most of the students had pre-registered for the second semester before they left to go home. And a lot of them were just getting home from a 7 to 13 loss to Nebraska in the Orange Bowl. And it was a probably as optimum a time as you could find for such a historical breakthrough. And Harold Franklin registered without incident. Since the university had also been ordered to provide housing, Harold was to be housed as the only student in a three-story wing of Magnolia Hall, an undergraduate dorm. And on the day of Franklin's entrance, Tom Murphy, a Presbyterian campus pastor, and I were stationed in the lobby of Magnolia Hall so that we could monitor the goings-on for the Justice Department, and we stayed in telephone contact with them at the Holiday Inn. Uh, everything went okay. When Harold Franklin came into Magnolia Hall at about 1 o'clock that afternoon, it hit me that this was the first time a black person had ever been in Magnolia Hall except to clean, uh, take out trash, or serve food. And after he checked into the dorm, he walked by himself, as they had planned it, across the campus to register. It was low-key, no press, no problem. The next day, the first day of class, I rode my bicycle to my office like I usually did, and on the way I stopped by the Presbyterian Church to see the pastor. When I went into his office, he was on the phone, and he motioned for me to come on in and sit down. And then he put his hand over the mouthpiece, and he said, somebody needs to get to Franklin right away because there's pressure from the administration to flunk him. And he signed up for two of the toughest professors that they are, and, and he's, I'm afraid he's not going to be able to cut it. I said, well, I don't know if you'll listen to me, but I'll go tell him. Uh, give me the keys to your car, and I'll do it right now. So I headed over to Magnolia Hall. It was on the other side of the campus from the church. Harold was in the middle of the second floor of the dorm, the only one, as I said, in that three-story wing. I had to clear security, and then I called him. And the doors to his part of the dorm were locked from the inside, so he had to come down and let me in. We talked for a little bit. I told him what our concern was, and he thanked me. And since the class was going to be starting pretty soon, he walked out with me. The rain was beginning to pick up, so I offered him a ride. And a few minutes later, I dropped him off at his class, and I was back in John's office in, oh, less than five minutes. Well, as I went into his office to return the keys to him and tell him what I had done, 
uh, his phone was ringing again. And I heard him say, yeah, yeah, that's, that's my license number. No, I didn't. Uh, but one of my colleagues borrowed my car and he visited with, with Mr. Franklin just a little while ago. It's raining here, and I, I suppose he must have dropped him off at his class. And I nodded my head, and, and John said, No, no, I don't have any comment about the nature of the visit. But when he hung up, he said, That was Washington. And they wanted to confirm that I had escorted Harold to class this morning. Within five minutes... Somebody had spotted John's car outside the classroom, called in the license plate number, and traced it to him, reported it to Washington, and an FBI agent in Washington had called to check it out. Uh, if we didn't think it was serious before then, we knew it was serious. And you need to uh, remember that this was almost 40 years ago, and before the computer age, at least for us. The Alabama Journal carried the story in the afternoon edition, and it identified me by name. I happened to be a junior. And years later, my mother told me that the, that same afternoon, my dad, who taught school in a high school about 90 miles away, got a call from the county superintendent's office to come in and see the county superintendent right away. Well, as soon as uh, class was out, school was over, Dad went in, and when he got there, the superintendent suggested, he had a copy of the paper laying on his desk, and he suggested that it was time for Dad to retire. Pretty clear threat. Daddy uh, told Mother about it, what, he'd, what had happened later, and when she asked him what he said, he said, I said, no, I'm not ready to retire and walked out of the office. My dad never said a word to me about that. I never heard that story from him. My wife and I were back in Alabama not too long ago, and we visited with Harold in Talladega. And we talked about the events of 1964, and we caught up with what's been happening with each other ever since. Even though Auburn integrated more peacefully, I think, than any other major Southern University, and Harold was never physically abused, the pressure from his advisor never let up. It never was a happy scene. And he left Auburn in 1965, a year later, and got his master's degree from the University of Denver. After that, he taught for a while at Talladega College, uh, traditionally a black college, and at Tuskegee Institute, and today he's managing a funeral home in the town in which he grew up. On May the 12th of 2001, Auburn University conferred an honorary Doctor of Arts degree on Harold Franklin during the spring commencement. The resolution calling for the conferring of the degree says in part that Harold was never accepted into the Auburn family despite the efforts and desires of his friends and supporters at Auburn University. Well, that was almost 40 years ago. Segregation has been officially over for years. But racial intolerance, well, that lives on. Just six months after the university conferred the degree on Harold in um, 2001, the Auburn chapters of the Delta Sigma Phi and the Beta Theta Pi fraternities were suspended for, quote, potentially offensive and racist conduct at Halloween parties on October the 25th and 27th. I don't think Harold Franklin ever saw himself as an activist. We talked about that the other day. But the door that he opened will never be completely shut again. And he did make a difference. It was good to see him. It made me feel good to know that Harold and I remembered the events of that January day in 64 in much the same way.
I seriously doubt that the role that I played changed things much at all. But I was changed. And for me, that's enough. About 25 miles south of Selma, the Alabama River takes a long, slow U-shape known as G's Bend. Back before the Civil War, that area belonged to a couple of huge plantations. And after the Emancipation Proclamation, the plantations were broken up into smaller farms, and a lot of the former slaves just stayed on. Some of them worked for the white farmers as tenants, and others worked out a kind of a sharecropping arrangement. And then the Depression hit, and after a while, the white farmers switched from cotton, soybeans, and cattle because it didn't require as much labor. There wasn't as much work to be had, and most of the folks just stayed on. Uh, in fact, that area for a while was a kind of a guinea pig for several federal programs, none of which lasted very long. After a while, the white owners just moved away and the black folks stayed and just made do the best way they could. It was then, and it still is today, an isolated area. There are about 10,000 acres that are defined by that long, slow curve of the river. Uh, and back before it was known as G's Bend, of course, it was Indian land. Some of the descendants from those Indians um, never left either. And today, if you look carefully, you can still see some of the characteristics in the people that survive. And in fact, there are some who have Indian surnames. There was a white Presbyterian pastor back in the 30s who said that G's men represents another civilization. He called it an Alabama Africa. And he said there's no more concentrated and racially exclusive Negro population in any rural community in the South than in G's Bend. In December of 1965, a young white Episcopal priest, himself a native of Mobile, Alabama, and newly appointed head of an Alabama civil rights project, was driving through the lower part of Dallas County to document cases where whites had been accused of harassing blacks who had been involved in the civil rights movement. When he got to G's Bend, he noticed that there were three beautiful quilts hanging from the clothesline of a, a little house. And he said they were unlike anything he'd ever seen. They had bold colors. Uh, if today we were describing them, we would say they had um, original op art patterns. And when he talked to the woman of the house, he learned that uh, she had made the quilts and that a lot of the women around there also made quilts. Well, Father Walters got an idea of how the black women of Dallas County could sell those quilts and improve their living conditions. He first thought that he would talk to the women and get them to give him the quilts on consignment, and he would take them and sell them uh, through some of his friends in New York. And his wife told him that just wouldn't work. And he said, why? And she said, well, because the people are going to be suspicious of any money-making schemes, but especially any that's proposed by white people. So what he did was he borrowed $700 from a civil rights memorial fund, and he brought, uh, bought some quilts for $10 apiece. Well, the women were, had been selling them for $5. And so they were thrilled to get uh, $10 for a quilt. And then he took all the quilts and sent them to New York. A friend of his who had a connection in the, one of the New York galleries set up an au auction, and they uh, sold the quilts for an average of about $28 per quilt. And then Father Walters returned the entire amount back to the women. And they used it to pay for washing machines, uh, telephones, indoor bathrooms. And in one instance, 
the college tuition for the great-granddaughter of a slave. Not only that, but within weeks, the Freedom Quilting Bee, a handcraft cooperative, was organized, and it's still in existence today. In 1968, I was serving as a campus pastor at Purdue University, and I wanted to expose the students, most of whom came from the middle part of Indiana, to some of the people who were in the middle of the struggle for their civil rights. And so we took a trip down south during uh, spring break. It turned out to be quite a trip. The first stop we made was in Nashville, and we went to the Grand Old Opera. Well, the place was packed, and to no surprise, the folks there were all white, with one exception. Our group was made up of several students. We had a couple of faculty and another campus pastor and me. And one of our students was Nathan Mbozi. He was a black African student from Nigeria. Well, needless to say, when I saw the makeup of the audience at the Grand Ole Opera, I was a little bit nervous, and the only seating was in the second balcony. As we started up for our seats, I noticed a couple of men watching us pretty carefully, and as we got closer, one leaned over and said something to the other one, and he immediately uh, left, and in what seemed to me a matter of seconds, there were two more men came and joined them. And the four of them stood right in the middle of our path. Well, I got up to the front of our group and, and I approached one of the men and I said, um, could you tell us where the, the best place to, to sit to watch the opera? And I said, we're a group of college students and we have a guest dignitary from Africa with us. And the Justice Department has asked me to let them know if there was any trouble or disturbance. And I would appreciate it if you don't mind if you'd kind of keep your eyes out open for us. Well, the man mumbled something about any place is as good a place as any to sit, and we moved on and took our seats. And as we sat down, Steve, the other campus minister, said, Max, the Justice Department? They don't even know anything about this trip, much less care about it. And I said, shh, Steve, they don't know that. Well, nothing happened. Uh, we enjoyed the performance, and after it was over, we drove out to a Methodist church nearby where we spent the night in sleeping bags on the floor of their fellowship hall. And um, the next morning, we headed on farther south. We met with an interracial community group in Huntsville in the Tennessee Valley. We uh, toured several sites in Birmingham. Then we dropped down into the Black Belt. The Black Belt is a fairly wide area of land that stretches across Mississippi, Alabama, and Georgia for the most part. And some people say it's called black because the soil was so rich and that's where the cotton plantations grew up. Uh, other people say that the black refers to the slaves who came in to work, and, and I, I think both may be right. But anyhow, that's an area of the country that used to be much richer than it is now in terms of the soil. And in the 1960s, it was where the struggle for civil rights was fermenting. I'd heard about the Freedom Quilting Bee, so after we had lunch in Selma, we drove south. We showed up at G's Bend about middle of the afternoon. Eugene Witherspoon met us and offered us a drink of water. We stood around the well, and as he let out the bucket on the rope and listened for a splash, and then he turned the wooden crank and pulled up a bucket that was brimming with the coldest, clearest water I think I've ever tasted. And we passed around the community gourd dipper, and everybody took a drink. Uh, we visited with some of the women. Uh, 
They were quilting at the time, watched them make some quilts, and bought a couple for the campus ministry center. And we visited longer than we had planned to, and as the sun started going down, Eugene said, why don't y'all spend the night with us? Well, when he said that, Steve, who was a little apprehensive about this whole trip, kind of eased up to me, and he said, Max, I don't think this is a good idea. Uh, this might be kind of dangerous down here. And I thought, well, you know, this might be the very experience we need. So I said, Eugene, I appreciate I think we'll do that. Well, it turned out to be the night of our lives. There was no way that all of us could stay in one house because the houses were simply too small. So we were divided into twos and threes and hosted by several different families. And we're talking about one- and two-room shacks in some cases. And, of course, mostly had outdoor plumbing. The accommodations were simple, and the food that we ate was prepared from government surplus commodities, but the hospitality was elegant. Steve and I stayed with the Witherspoons, and we visited with Eugene and Estelle uh, after supper for a while. I was getting a little worried that we were going to keep them up too late, and um, but when Steve asked, uh, Eugene said, oh, no, don't worry about it. He said, we stay up late all the time. Sometimes we step as late as 8.30. Well, I knew it was time for us to... Over the years, I've come to realize just how important it is to remember and to tell our stories. And sometimes the remembering is enough. My wife and I visited my dad once when he was in the nursing home, not too long before he died. We had just about talked out and we were sitting quietly when dad looked at me and he said, Do you remember the time? And then he stopped. But I could see he was pulling up something from his past. And I watched as his eyes took on that reflective look, and he would smile, and he went on the right way for over six minutes as we sat in complete silence. I could almost see his mind working. And then he smiled and said, Huh! And I said, Dad, that must have been a good story. He said it was. To this day, I have no idea what he was recalling, but I know it was a good story. I hope you have enjoyed these stories as much as I enjoy telling them. More importantly, I hope it will encourage you to tell or at least remember your own. Because sometimes you may find yourself in the center of something that's very exciting, and sometimes you may find that you're completely left out of things. But I suspect that most of the time you'll find yourself, like I have, on the edge of things. And if you do, I hope you'll understand that what you write in the margins, that's what will be your story. And I trust it will be a good one.